Well, good morning. It's wonderful to see you all, such beautiful people. And uh, you got snacks? In my bag. Oh, really? Yeah, well, you've got to be prepared. You know, you never know what can happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have had a great week together. It's been very wonderful and huge um, blessing for me to be able to share it with you. Let's have a look in our Bibles. Ephesians chapter 4. So I'm going yeah, I'm going to read from the NRV and then uh, hopefully later I'll read a few passages from the message version as well of that same passage. And it's uh, I'm going to read from verse 17 to chapter 5 and verse 2. So it's a little bit of a lengthy passage. But as I read, um, it's Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. And uh, that's the church where the temple of Artemis was, uh, which was on top of the hill overlooking the city. And Artemis was one of those goddesses of fertility and war and prosperity um, that gave the people their identity and their power and their fear. And Paul is writing, and that's why he speaks about being seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus and how Christ has defeated principalities and powers and how that through the church we will make God's manifest wisdom known to principalities and powers. It's a power letter, their letters to the Ephesians, because of their context and, and what they were experiencing. And Paul always does that so wonderful brings truth in context, not just generally. And that's what leads to chapter 6, which is that chapter about spiritual warfare. And um, I think sometimes we misunderstand that and make that too simplistic, that chapter 6, almost like a, a prayer ritual. And if we read through the letter and see, pick out what Paul is saying as he gets to that point, he, he kind of brings it as a little... Um, meme, a kind of a summary, a way to remember all that he said. And so we mustn't detach chapter 6 from the rest and, and um, just teach that. So this is not going to try to link all that together, but that's the context in which he's now writing. And he's just said that we've been given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, these gifts from Jesus to equip the church so that we can do what we've got to do. Uh, and then he goes on to just speak a little bit about community, you know, and he's going to speak about truth and righteousness, those two things that are there in chapter 6, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, and so he's going to define them, especially righteousness, a little bit more, and so we, we see what he's saying and what we have to do to wage war when we read this, this passage. So uh, let's have a look there, Ephesians 4, verse 17. Oh, and I want you to also look, please, to see where it says Father, God the Father, where it says Christ or Lord or Jesus, and where it says the Holy Spirit, because it's a Trinitarian passage, and he's, he's referencing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in how we to build community, how we to be a righteous community, because that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about individual righteousness. He's talking about the community. The people of God can wage war when they are righteous, when they are right with one another, right with God, and um, finding themselves living in the grace of God. And so I've called this um, the culture of grace, this message of mine, culture of grace. And he's defining what that culture of grace looks like. Uh, in Romans chapter 5, he says that grace may reign through righteousness. <laughs> so it's a kingdom of grace. We could say it's an empire of grace, the kingdom of God. It's, it's a kingdom of grace, it's an empire of grace, different to the empire of Rome, which was an empire of control through violence, through threats of violence. And so it was a different kind of empire. And he's, he, Paul always contrasts that. Every, every time Paul says, Lord, actually it's a political statement, because <laughs> he's telling you there is a king above Caesar. And if that gets out to be that known that Paul is preaching that, they'll kill him like they killed Jesus. So it's a little bit subversive, this gospel, and some people say it's not, but every time you say Lord, you're talking about Caesar, because they said Caesar is Lord, and Paul comes and says Jesus is Lord. Now, you can't have two lords in, a, in an empire, just not going to work. So let's have a look then and see what he's saying. Very highly charged uh, uh, le um, letter, this one of Ephesians. So I tell you this, verse 17, and insist on it in the Lord 
that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts, having lost all sensitivity or having lost spirit, or being filled with spiritual apathy. So the a Passion Translation says it, lost spirit, all sensitivity, spiritual apathy. is a just don't want to, what's the point? I've lost all sensitivity. They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. So that's kind of how people who are living in Ephesus who don't know Christ, haven't come under the lordship of Jesus, live, and they live with that. Artemis was there to make them wealthy. They're full of greed. They're coming to that temple of Artemis to be made wealthy, almost by superstition or luck or some spiritual power, and they'd be there to be protected, and they're not thinking. They're just superstitious. They're just acting in a way that is just wanting to get blessing without any sense of involvement in building. And that's what Paul is now going to pull apart. He says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Wonderful, isn't it? And that's what everybody has to learn. That's what we do when we go out and plant the gospel seed. We teach people about Jesus. We teach them that Jesus is the Christ. Now, we miss this. I wish the translations would start to go back to some, some do, they, but they would speak about Messiah. Because when we speak about Christ, some people think, you know, Jesus Christ, it's like his first name is Jesus and his surname is Christ. Jesus Christ. And we don't see it's, it's saying Jesus the Messiah. We're saying it's Jesus, the promised one from the prophets, who's the Messiah, the anointed one. Passion translation says anointed one when it translates, and that kind of helps to break that thing of, of Christ. Um, it's going to be funny when we get to heaven and we call him Yeshua. <laughs> it's going to be weird, isn't it? Like, I've called you Jesus all my life, and now you're Yeshua. It's like, going to blow us away. Yeah? And he's like, well, call me Jesus if you want to. If you want to be Latin, you know, you can do it. He doesn't mind. <laughs> but his name is Yeshua, <laughs> Joshua. Yeshua, it's like he's Jewish, and we've made him into non-Jewish kind of Jesus. And that's good in one sense, because we've pulled him into our culture, and for the Greeks and the Romans they, they, they who were saved, they made him part of their culture, their flower pot. But then you can't give that to somebody else. They've got to find Jewish Jesus in their culture, the Messiah. So it was, it was good what we've done. Those Renaissance paintings where we see Jesus with you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, they're good because he's now our Jesus. But they're not real because he's Jewish Jesus. <laughs> and let other people paint him in their culture and you get a black Jesus or a yellow Jesus. And then we say, that's not right. Well, it's like neither is ours, <laughs> us Western people. <laughs> it's going to be quite a jumble when we get to heaven, isn't it? It's going to be like, whoa. <laughs> you know, like Trevor Noah tells the joke when the person gets saved, uh, gets, dies, and they go to heaven, and they find St. Peter at the pearly gates, and, uh, and they're like, but you, you, St. Peter, you're black. It's like, I never expected that. And I thought, I thought it's so, so confusing. I, I never expected to find black St. Peter at the gates. You know, like, he says, well, okay, you know, you're black. I didn't think that. And St. Peter says to him, wait till you meet Jesus. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of surprises where our culture is going to be just ripped apart. And we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is so confusing. So we have to see, is Jesus the Messiah? He's the Jewish Jesus who was promised for all nations. Man, isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? So we all get to share him in our own unique way. And it's not wrong. We, we plant him into our heart, into our culture, and he grows up in our culture. But don't forget... He's Jesus, the Messiah, <laughs> who came, that they came, Romans chapter 1, the son of David. He came in the line of David to be a Jewish king, but then to be the Lord of all lords and the king of all kings. King over Caesar. So as soon as you say, Lord, you're in trouble <laughs> in, in ancient Rome. We think, ah, oh, no, it's like, a, it's, it's just, they're talking about a spiritual thing. No, they're not. You went down to the marketplace and whispered, Jesus is Lord. You know, people say, shut up, man. Do you want us all to end up in jail? 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, the truth that is in Jesus. So here he speaks about truth. And earlier in chapter 1, he said the gospel is the truth. So the good news about Jesus is the truth. Not just his life on earth, but the fact that he came as Messiah, the rescuer, the deliverer, the one sent by God to set the people free. And that's why he opens the book of Isaiah when he starts his message to say that he's one to set, the blind can see, the deaf can hear, the lame can walk, and he'll set the captives free. That, that's him. That's how he's deaf to find. The one to break in the kingdom of God and usher it in and announce it. It's, it's begun. It's happening. This kingdom movement. That's him. So he speaks a little bit about truth here, but a little bit earlier. But then he goes on to speak about this culture of grace. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. That's all that he's explained before. With regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted in its deceitful desires. That's an interesting word, desires, because it's your desires that corrupt you. As Romans 8 has a lot to say about desires of the spirit and desires of the flesh. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Wow, quite a thing, eh? So we put on this new righteousness like created to be like God. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. So you now he said we've got to put off the old life, put on the new. Now he's kind of ex going to unpack that. He's going to explain. Okay, this is how you do that. Just in case we're not quite sure. He says, this is how you do it. Therefore, put off falsehood, speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not, which is a quote if you look at the margin from Psalm 4 verse 4. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. And do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example. Follow God's example. Interesting, eh? Follow God's example. He sent Christ, but follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, and sacrifice to God. Beautiful, wonderful instruction from, from Paul of, of how to live. And so um, this idea of grace and being a culture of grace is very important. And there's many ways to look at grace. Amazing grace, we sing the song. Um, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness, Paul writes to Titus. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that grace helped him to work harder but not him, but the grace working through him. So, so grace doesn't. Grace is not laziness. Grace is not God doing everything. Grace is empowering us so that we can do what God called us to do. That we that we have that gracious, loving power to be like God to to do the things that God sent Christ to do. We can do. Yeah, that's grace. And so, um, in nineteen uh, in two thousand and sixteen. I don't play golf, but I, I read about this. Uh, Ernie Els was playing with Phil Mickelson in Scotland. And Phil Mickelson was about to shoot a 62 in a Masters, which had never been done before. And as they approached the putting green, uh, Ernie Els said to Phil Mickelson, who they'd all been, they'd been rivals since they were teenagers, you know, playing golf, winning, losing against each other for, for many, many years. But now Phil Mickelson is about to break a, a barrier. It's like running the four-minute mile. You're sending a rocket to the moon for a golfer. You know, you just can't. No one shot 62 in a Masters. Never happened before. And so Ernie else says, goes up to Phil Mickelson, his opponent, and he says to him, "Come on, you can do it, bud. I'm, I'm for you. I'm rooting for you." <laughs> Which is incredible. This is the guy who's going to beat him if he does it and begin to become, you know, a world hero. And, and they've been competing all their lives since they were teenagers, and else will be marginalized, and Mickelson will be promoted. But he comes and says, you can do it. Yeah, I can. And then it's for Mickelson to putt before else, the way the balls are laying on the green, the, the, the etiquette of golf. 
But if you putt last, you've got more chance to just see what else everyone else does and see what's going on and take your time and breathe. So El says to Mickelson, he says, I'll putt before you so that you've got time to, to, to hit this record. <laughs> Which now, if you're competing, and now we've got the Rugby World Cup, you know, it's like you don't give your opponent an advantage. You're not, you're going you're gonna to go and I'm going to watch you and put pressure on you because you're not going to beat me. But El says to him, no, you can do it. And, and, and he putts first. And then Mickelson lines up his putt and he gets his caddy and they've seen what's happened. And he's going for a world record, being given all this privilege and space. And his ball goes to the cup and it just clips the cup and goes out. <laughs> but the write-up that I read, the newspaper article said, you know, something more than a world record was achieved that day. And something of sportsmanship triumphing over winning or losing. Something, I didn't say this, but I just thought, that's grace. That's grace. You see, grace is when suddenly you see you give others what they need at your disadvantage. And you rejoice in it. It's not like, oh, I'm suffering. because No, you, you, you want to see something bigger happen for the sake of the game. The record that someone can actually shoot a 62. That someone can break the four-minute mile. That someone can do this incredible thing it needs to happen for everyone to know it's possible. Otherwise, it's impossible. And you can do it, and I'll support you, even though you're my enemy. <laughs> and that's grace. That's grace. That's grace. And that record was broken the next year by Brandon Grace, who's a South African, just by the way. He did see 62. <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in, you know. Not that I'm a golfer or know anything about it, but I know about grace. And I know what it means to live in grace. And so I want to give you a little um, just demonstration of what, what grace looks like. So um, excuse me for a moment while I act like Clark Kent. <laughs> I haven't got a Superman shirt. But... Wow. I've got a fly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh... no, I want to see it. Just there. So uh... I can't use this jacket in Singapore, but I can in, in New Zealand. So what Paul says, and this is so important for us, he says, what does he say? If you're going to live this life of grace and have a culture of grace, you've got to put off, put off your old life. You have, you have to take it off. You've got to take it off. Grace won't take it off. You have to take it off. Take off your old life. And then he says, what? Put on. Put on your new life. Put on the life of Christ. You have to put it on. You've got to take it off and put it on. See, sometimes we get to be like those people who worship Artemis. We get superstitious. Something good's going to happen to us because Jesus died for us. And yes, it is. But you have to act in faith to enter into the grace that has been promised to you. So you have to put it off and then put it on. Want me to do it again? Just in case you didn't see what's going on. All right. All right. So. I like the sound effects. Good. <laughs> you. What does he say? Put off. Can you read it again? You read it as I do it. Yeah, read it there. Uh, yeah, yeah, Paul, you read it for me. You guys all read it together. Read it for me there. What verse are we at? You're right. this, uh, so yeah. you were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off, put off. your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires. Then 23, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Thank you. Bless you. Now I wanted you to read it because you see that little verse in between? To be made new in the attitude of your minds. Yeah, it's so important because when you put off and before you put on, in the process of putting off and putting on, something happens where you start to think differently. You start to have a different attitude to life. You start to have an attitude that's not a victim, it's now a victor. You start to become more than a conqueror. Through God who has loved us. 
which in Romans 8, when Paul writes that, that's about you personally. More than a conqueror, it's about your life, not just your community. It's about you. And then he goes on to see how the community is more than a conqueror. So you, 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 and it's not your outside life. It's not you conquering your circumstances. It's conquering your inner life, your victimhood, your aloneness, your crushedness, your trauma that you've experienced. And the Holy Spirit comes and he allows you to be more than a conqueror. Those things don't dictate the way you live. You don't get hijacked by your emotions because you've had trauma in your past. And every time you experience that again, the trauma and the reminder of that comes back and it hijacks you and you go and do the things you don't want to do and the things you want to do, you don't do. (laughs) Because something happens where you can become renewed in your mind, as Paul says in Romans 12. Have your mind renewed, your attitude renewed. And you think, I'm not a victim. If Joseph, when he was thrown in the dungeon because of being accused of assaulting Potiphar's wife and spending all those years, his brothers deceived him, into Potiphar's house, into the dungeon, sitting there, the cupbearer and the baker interprets their dreams, and then the cupbearer forgets for two years. If Joseph had been bitter, he would never have got out of that dungeon, and he wouldn't have gone to interpret Pharaoh's dream and be promoted overnight. You see, grace comes when we deal with that issue. And so we can't live in bitterness and victimhood. We've, we've all been victimized. Larry Crabb, the wonderful uh, Christian counselor, says we're all victims of imperfect parents. <laughs> For the parents, we say, oh, my, my poor children. <laughs> and for the rest of us, we say, yeah, it's true. We're all victims of imperfect parents. There are no perfect parents, so everyone makes mistakes. And Hebrews chapter 12 says you can either let a root of bitterness get into your heart or you can find grace. And you can then be healed because of Christ, because of the cross. And so we have this thing of our minds get involved. And our actions are important so that we can go for the higher goal. As in the golf analogy, let's score that 62. Let's break the record. Let's go for something bigger. Let's not be so cramped personally that, oh, I've been victimized. Poor me. Uh, My problems. Uh, It's unfair. Uh, shouldn't have happened. I wish my mom, my dad, my headmaster, my school teacher, my boss, whatever, hadn't done that. If only someone should have rescued me. You know, it's all the scenario we can run. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's passed. It's finished. Amen. Or you can come and say, okay, all that happened. But as with Joseph, God can use this to promote me. Because I know some pain, I can help people who've been in pain. Because I've had some loss, I can help people who've been in loss. Because I know what suffering looks like, and others may not. I can help you if, you've been su- if you go through suffering. <laughs> and, and I can use it. I can, I can find grace. I can find a ministry because of that. Or I can let that sink me, and the devil gets the victory. So we say, help us, Jesus. So he starts here. He says, okay, first of all, he's got four, four little things he's telling us. Firstly, he says we must have a foundation of truth, which I said already is the gospel he already explained that. But this um, new foundation that must come into our life. So, so in, in modern times, we, we get this thing now that people are going with their feelings. You know, you must be an authentic person. You go with your feelings. What, if you feel it, then do it. Be authentic. Don't, don't be a hypocrite. Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't be someone who's not feeling it and doing it or, or not acting on your feelings. Um, Imposter syndrome, you know, just like yo, you're, 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 doing, you're not doing what you feel, so you're in, an imposter. Now, don't go with your feelings, friends, because your feelings are going to lead you into just kind of a nowhere land because there's no anchor. There's no anchor to your feelings, and it doesn't lead us into unity because we all feel differently. But truth can anchor you. Once you've got an anchor of truth, you go with your feelings. Because the very next thing is he talk about anger, emotions, feelings. But first he talks about truth, then feelings. Feelings motivate you. They help you. But if you anchor your life on your feelings, they will drag you down. But if you anchor your life on the truth, and Jesus said in John 17, God's word is truth. That's the truth we have. We have this outside anchor. So there was a, a, a lady flying once, and she was really nervous, you know, flying in an airplane and just terrified and the cabin staff tried to pacify her, and she was just too scared. So they called the captain. They said, please come and talk to her because she's disrupting everyone around her, and they're all getting scared. We're going to crash. We're going to all die. We're going to, you know, the planes are going, oh, oh, oh. You know, they're there. So the captain came and said to her, he said, listen, ma'am. He said, can you look out on the wing there? 
And she said, yes. And she said, you see that little light on the end of the wing there, how it's flickering? She says, yes. He says, you just keep your eyes on that. As long as that light's flickering, this, place is, this plane is safe and we're not going to crash. She said, thank you. And she just watched that light and she felt peace. Of course, it means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try it, it means nothing. Because <laughs> that light is anchored to this plane. You know, there's no assurance in that light. <laughs> it's anger. I mean, if that light goes out, you've got big problems. <laughs> You're already in under the water, you know. <laughs> you already hit the mountain by the time that light goes out. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't anchor yourself by yourself. You can't anchor yourself by your feelings. You've got to find an outside reference point. So in, in 1961, when Yuri Gagarin, the Russian cosmonaut, went up into space, and then he came back down, and uh, Khrushchev, the, the Russian premier, announced, our astronaut has been up to space, he got there, up there, he had a good look around, uh, he looked for God, he couldn't see him, there is no God. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, he's been up to heaven, and he looked, and there's no God up there. He said, we've explored it, and there's no God. Uh, that's the truth. The facts tell you that. C.S. Lewis said it would be like Hamlet going up into his castle looking for William Shakespeare. <laughs> you can't find the creator in the story. He is there. He is there in every fiber of the story because he's created it. But you won't find him unless he writes himself into the story as a personality, which some people do. You know, we are kind of odd for William Shakespeare to kind of shake hands with Hamlet and slap him on the back. But some people do that in their stories. They do write themselves in. Mel Gibson wrote himself into the passion. And uh, he was the soldier who drove the stake into Jesus' hand. He wrote himself into that movie and acted that small little role, driving the stake into Jesus' hand to say, my sin put him on the cross. And sometimes we can write ourselves into the story. And God wrote himself into his story by sending Jesus. And he did write himself into the story. But you can't find him, the author, up there. Only if he writes himself in will you find him walking around here. And so truth, you see, has to be anchored in some time outside of this universe even. Outside of this expanding universe is the creator. And you won't find him in the universe unless he writes himself in. But you will find him in his word because that's how he's revealed himself to us. Through the word, through the prophets, through his son that confirms the prophets. And then through all those who went out preaching in his name. And so we must anchor ourselves to truth. The belt of truth that helps us to win this war is not just any truth, any facts. It's the truth of the gospel that God has rescued us and sent a rescuer to help us. And that's the truth. Not our feelings, friends. And when you've got that truth then you can find your feelings can motivate you. But for your feelings to motivate you, Paul here writes and he says, uh, verse 25, Therefore each of us must put off falsehood and speak truthfully. Exactly that. Put off, put on. For we are all members of one body. That's what brings unity. See, feelings will bring disunity if that's our anchor. But truth will bring unity if that's our anchor. But then he says feelings. He says, then in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. So he goes on to feelings, truth, then feelings. And he says, in your anger, do not sin. So I've heard uh, pastors at marriage seminars tell us, you know, in your anger, do not sin. Do not go to bed while you're still angry. Um, message version. Can you put the message version up for that, for, for that, those three verses there? Thanks. We're going to have a look at them. But uh, I've heard them say that and um, then, you know, couples... They must talk all night till they get this thing resolved. <laughs> they never sleep, yeah. Yeah, and they never sleep and they fight and they get more and more tired. And the more tired you get, the more irritated you get. And the more irritated they get, the more unreasonable you get. And the more you become disanchored from truth and more anchored to your emotions. I feel you said, you didn't say. And uh, that is a recipe for disaster, I want to tell you. I want to say, if you're a pastor and you've done that at a marriage seminar, I want to ask you, did you ever do it yourself? Because <laughs> if you did, you could end up in an argument, I bet. So, so, so it's not, Paul is not saying that. You say, we, we, I find that us preachers are very bad at repeating what other preachers say without living it. 
Better we go back to see what the Bible said and then try to live it and wrestle with it to find what is it saying. And I've preached many things right out of the preacher said and then found, whoops, I have to apologize, you know, because. All right, now put the, uh, N, not the NIV, the message version. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, message version says this quite nicely. Um, you got it? Oh, you don't have it. Uh, I'll, mean, I'll read it for you. Uh, so that's why I brought my, my bag, Michael, not for my snacks. So my, my ancient uh, message version, this is like one of the first ones that we ever printed, and there it is, broken, buckled, bent, well used, a sword. So the message version says this, uh, go ahead be, and be angry. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. Paul is quoting from Psalm 4 verse 4. And Psalm 4 verse 4 says, when you go to your bed, then, then, then search yourself and deal with the issue. <laughs> so he's not saying, argue with your wife all night. Not saying that at all. He's saying, search your own heart. Don't go to bed while you're angry. You've got a choice to make. You see, emotions are very important. They motivate us. Emotions, emote, they motivate. They help you get the job done. Or they can sink you, depending if you're bitter or find grace. And so Paul is saying, don't argue with your wife all night or anybody in the church all night. Don't, you know, don't have to settle this issue till the sun goes down. He's saying, you, in your heart, you go home. You were angry. You were right to be angry. Eugene Peterson translates it. Go ahead, be angry. Angry is a good thing. Angry is a good emotion. If you see injustice, as C.S. Lewis says when you read the Psalms, injustice should fuel anger. If you don't get angry at injustice, then something's not right in your Christian walk. But then don't let that anger cause you to act in a wrong way. And so once you're angry, now you have a choice. You have a choice to get bitter and let a root of bitterness get into your heart like a cancer and start to eat you, or you can find grace and you can forgive. And what Paul is saying, find the grace to move on. We want to be a community of grace. A community of grace. So for me, you see, when I was uh, probably seven or eight years old, I went to a new school. I didn't know the kids. And one day at the school, we had like a thousand kids in the school, great big hall in the school. And uh, they said something about, we're going to have to stay in half an hour longer or something at assembly. Something's got to be done. And everyone went, oh, and the vice head called me from the back. He said, you, that boy. I'm like, me? Yes, you. He says, come here. And he called me to the front and he beat me in front of all the kids. And I'm like, what have I done? New in the school, didn't know anyone. And they just beat me. So oh, I'm going to get you. Every time I drove past that school when I'd grown up, I thought, I'm going to get that dude. I'm going to get him. I'm going to punch him. <coughs> Kick him. He had a son. I'm going to get his son too. Kick him. <laughs> Make him suffer. I'm pastoring a church. <laughs> and I drive past that, my primary school. And I think, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get that vice head. I thought, when I go to heaven, I know this is not a good attitude to have. So I thought, when I go to heaven, you know, and St. Peter, Black St. Peter lets me in. <laughs> I'm going to go and look for that dude. Not to say forgive you. I'm going to go and hit him, head back. <laughs> <laughs> And then I said, oh, Jesus, please forgive me because I know you love me. And I know there's forgiveness in heaven. There must be. But, but I am so bitter in my heart. I'm so wounded and broken that I'm thinking. And then I moved to Singapore. And then I realized I brought this dude with me to Singapore. He should have stayed in Africa, but I brought him with me. And now he's tormenting me in Singapore too. I don't drive past my old school, but I still have feelings for him. And I was still thinking, I'm going to get him. He wounded me. He, he shamed me in front of that whole school. I was a new boy. And everyone looked at me as the kid who got beat for nothing. Oh, there goes the kid got beat. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, there he goes. Yeah, yeah, he must have done something because no one would get beat for nothing. There he goes, you know. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm that dude. I don't know what I did, but, you know, but I'm going to get him. I'm going to sort him. And then I thought, dear Lord, what has happened to me? I brought him to Singapore and I had to say, Jesus, I forgive him. I forgive him. He doesn't even know. He doesn't know he came to visit Singapore. 
took him on a world tour. <laughs> He's been to many nations now. <laughs> He doesn't even know, but I live with the bitterness. I live with the pain because I can't find grace. So, oh God, I have to forgive him and help me, Jesus. And then Jesus help me. And now I can genuinely say, when I see him, I'm going to kiss him. Not like Judas. <laughs> Not that kind of kiss. <laughs> He's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Get him, Lord. <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> now no, I'll give him a kiss and I'll have coffee with him. <laughs> because uh, he tormented me, but I'm free now. <laughs> and we say to his friends, we, we can't live in that place of wanting revenge. That's what Eugene Peterson says. Don't look for revenge. See, it's not about sorting the issue out. It's about you've got an emotion, whatever it might be. And you can't, you can't help your reaction. Emotions, they come. But you can choose how you take that emotion on. You have a choice. And you can get bitter. And a root of bitterness can start to eat you up and get into every fiber of your being. And how you speak to other people, how you react to other people, how you see them through that lens of being a victim. And you start to pollute all your relationships because you think everyone's out to get you. <laughs> and you forget you've got a savior who's teaching you to change the attitude of your mind. <laughs> He's not just forgiven your sin. He wants to change the attitude of your mind. He wants to set you free from all this trauma of the past. From everything that's happened. And, uh, and you know, trauma is stored here. You know that. It's stored in your gut. But Jesus said out of your inmost being will flow rivers of living water. <laughs> And so the Holy Spirit comes and starts to release you. And I think praise and worship, singing in tongues, speaking in tongues is a wonderful release from the inmost being out. Ministering to other people by the life of the Spirit releases something. You realize, oh, the grace of God is so beautiful. Why ever was I bitter? Why did I hold on to this thing, man? You know? Man, you've got to kill that old man. That's why we get baptized under the water, drowned, dead, finished, up, out. New man. <laughs> but then the devil comes and he gets a foothold because we get hurt. I mean, he, can't, he gets in, puts his foot in the door. That's what the foothold is. Huh? You just want to close it or puts his foot in. He won't close. He says, I'm going to creep my way into your life once again. And we say, no, don't give him a foothold. That's what it means. It means don't linger on that pain too long. Deal with it. Don't argue with your wife all night. You go back to your bed, Psalm 4, verse 4, and you deal with it in the privacy of you and Jesus and saying, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for my life. Paul goes on right at the end to speak about forgiveness. This is the one place he doesn't say put off and put on. He just says, don't give the devil a foothold, and then he doesn't say what we ought to do. But at the end of the chapter, he says, and forgive. I wonder if he, I wonder if he read it himself and he thought, oh, I've forgotten to tell what to do. <laughs> Or if he did it on purpose, forgiveness is so important that he put it at the end as a kind of exclamation mark. I don't know. He's probably got his amniostesis, you know, the one who's writing for him, to read it and realize, read that again. Oh, I forgot the forgiveness part puts it in. We had a play in South Africa called The Rabbi. It was a one-man play done by one guy on stage about Paul the, Paul the Apostle, but as a rabbi, and he's a rabbi. And uh, he's in jail, and he's dictating to Luke, because Luke was his amnesthesis, so he wrote for Paul. And he's in jail, and he's dictating to Luke, and he says something like this, and this, and, this, and, this, and, and he says, and Luke, he says, read, read that again for me. And he says, I can't hear you. Read, read, I can't hear you. He says, give me your notes. He takes Luke's notes, and he says, like, I can't read this. He says, Lord, I ask for a scribe, and you give me a doctor. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, Luke was a doctor, indeed. And doctors have very bad handwriting. So, don't let the sun go down. Don't give the devil a foot off. So, you see, it's, it's about spiritual warfare. Isn't that interesting? 
You come to the end and you find, you know, put on the belt of truth, rest, rest, rest. But this is how it's telling you how to do it. It's not, oh, in the morning I wake up, I put on the belt of truth, you know, I put on the rest, rest, rest. Just, people taught us to, to work like that, you know. Oh, I take up the sword in the morning. Yeah, good to remind you, but go and read the letter to see how you do that. Because how you do that is you forgive your enemy and you get rid of the bitterness. And you, that's the war, you see, because otherwise you've given the devil a foothold. And then he's in. In Germany, in 1918, I think it was, 1918, after the Azusa Street revival in America, where the Holy Spirit was poured out in power in, in Azusa Street with William Seymour, and people began to speak in tongues again, and the Holy Spirit Pentecostal movement started to go all over the world. And uh, people were being baptized in the Spirit, being released in the gifts of the Holy Spirit in power, going out on missions. John G. Lake came through Azusa Street and came to South Africa and preached in South Africa and brought a, a revival in our nation. But Germany had a similar revival. And the German churches got together to have a look at it because, you know, like the Toronto blessing, there's a whole lot of funny things that happen when God arrives. <laughs> and not everyone's happy. Not every Christian's happy. And they're like, hmm, this looks a bit weird. And so the German church got together and they made what was called the Berlin Declaration where they said this that we're seeing now of the Holy Spirit is not from above, it's from below. 1918, when you cut out the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, you invite in the Spirit of Antichrist. And the German churches invited that into their nation, and they got Adolf Hitler very soon after that. Very sobering, isn't it? Same in our own lives. Don't cut out the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul goes right at the end. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us to do all these things. There are phenomenon. There are signs and wonders and all sorts of things. And some of that is a little bit off-putting. Some of it, that is fake. Because, you know, what happened like in Azusa Street is everybody came. All the flakes came as well. And they had uh, people who were into wizardry and witchcraft and voodoo coming into those meetings. And you can't discern what's what. But you can discern when people are dealing with their bitterness and having their mind renewed in Christ and finding grace, you know God is there. God is there. And so just leave all that, like Jesus said. You can't discern the wheat from the tears. It's says, so and all together. It happens every time there's a move of God. You can't discern it, but just leave it. Don't try and pull it out. You destroy what God is doing even. You kill the good fruit. <laughs> so it's a very odd and strange thing. And people are pressuring you. Deal with it. Sort it out. That one's faking it. How do you know? You're not quite sure. <laughs> And just, just let it go for its season and let deal with preaching Jesus. That's what Seymour said in the Zuzu Street. He said, when, they, when people go out of this building, he said, out of these meetings, I don't want them talking about tongues or the life of the Spirit, much as that's important. I want them preaching Jesus. <laughs> and that keeps you anchored again. Your word is truth. Christ is the living word who came. Keeps you anchored. But you need the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ. And you need the Holy Spirit to help you to forgive. So... Then he goes on to say, okay, now change your actions, not only change your emotions, not only build on a, a foundation of truth, but he says, now let's be real, let's change our actions. And so he says, verse 28, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. I mean, it, it is Michael Eaton says, grace teaches you to go further than law. Isn't that interesting? Because we all think like law is a high standard. Grace is like an easy standard. No, 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 no. Hang on, wait. Law just tells you to stop stealing. The life of grace says stop stealing, start working, get a skill, and then start giving. <laughs> grace expects a lot more from you than law. Law just like don't go here. You know, that's keep you safe. But grace says I want you to live a life. I want you to break free. I want that old life. There, stealing life, dead, finished. But then I want a new life. You put on Christ. You put on this new life. You start acting in a new way. We know that's true if you want to break a habit. You've got to stop doing the thing, and then you've got to start doing something else, because otherwise you'll be filled with your thoughts of that thing, and you can't find the new thing. You know, like if I say to you, don't think of a pink elephant, well, that's what you're going to think of. Isn't that right? It's like, I say, stop thinking about a pink elephant, and then you're going to go, how do I? It <laughs> won't go away, you know. But if I say, okay, replace that thought with a beautiful cafe latte. Okay. Gone the pink elephant. Finished. 
Yes, and the new one has come. Yeah, yeah, you've got to replace, you've got to renew your thinking, change your thinking, change your heart. It's, 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 it's not rocket science, it's grace. <laughs> but Paul is telling us how to do it. It's like explaining it. You stop and then you start. You put off, you put on. And just take baby steps. I mean, if, 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 you, if, if you don't tithe, then you have no money to tithe. Then I want to encourage you what people used to do in the 1960s. They had a graduated tithe. 10% of 10%. The tithing is, you know, 10% of your income is the Lord's. It's your, it's your kingdom tax, if you like, to keep the kingdom going and the nations getting to the world. It's not, not like a tax like this world's tax because the empire of God is not like the empires of this world. But if you'd like, it's your kingdom tax. Because <laughs> it's his, not yours. It's not your giving. It's just bringing what is his. But if you're poor and you can't, Jesus doesn't want you not to eat because you're bringing your tithe. You know, he's concerned about your eating, but he wants to get you out of this. He wants you to kill that. He wants to rescue you. So don't keep saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. Say, I can. This month, I'll give 10% of 10%. So if your tithe is $100, you're going to give 10%. If it should be $100 and you can't afford it, you give $10. And next month, you give 20. And next month, you give 30. And the next month, you give 40. Because you, 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 you're killing something and you're replacing it with something. You're not just in the middle, I can't. If, you, if I can't, then, you, then you, there's no grace. There's no faith. There's nothing for God to bless. <laughs> and, and you're stuck and you just go, and then the, you give the devil a foothold. And then he's just this war, he starts to win the war. And he starts to just drag you down. And then your old headmaster comes with you to Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> You've got, you got to deal with that thing and, yeah, have the mind renewed. <laughs> so it's not mind science. It's not mind over matter. It's just believing what God says in His Word. It's building your life on truth, not on feelings. Building your life on what God said, not on what you feel you can do. Because saying I can't means He can't. <laughs> saying I won't means I'm a rebel. <laughs> and you're going to say, no, He can and I will. So, so do a graduated tithe if you, if you find you just... It, Budget-wise, you can't. Do what, do what you can. Do what you can. And if you have to risk 10% of 10% and not eat one meal every day, then do that. I mean, people have done that before. It's not like you'll die. You'll get, you'll get certainly hungry and pray, which is good. Because <laughs> then you'll pray your way out of that problem. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's just like a practical, let's live the Christian life and let's not be victims. Because the devil wants you to be a victim and say, I can't. And Jesus can't, and I'm just going down. But Jesus wants to rescue you, get you to think differently, find a way to put on Christ, put on Christ, put on Christ. So you have to... You have to do more under, under grace than under law. And he's asking us to do... Much, much more. In uh, Genesis 14, we find that Melchizedek, it's when Abraham meets Melchizedek, Melchizedek blesses Abraham, and then Abraham tithes, gives 10% to Melchizedek. And when I first read Hebrews referring to that, I thought, that's, Hebrews got it the wrong way around, because I thought you tithe, and then you get blessed. That's what I was taught. When you tithe, God blesses you. But when I read Hebrews, and then I went back to read Genesis 14, I thought, oh, no, no, hang on, wait. You get blessed, then you tithe. So, so tithing is out of the blessing God's given you. So if God gives you any blessing, you give 10% back. And in, in the, uh, Genesis 14, you see that Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, a, a, a high priest and king in Zion, in, in Jerusalem, or uh, king of Salem. And uh, it's a picture of Jesus. And so after that, he gets to say, the king of Sodom, who was there, who he rescued his nephew Lot from, and he says to the king of Sodom, you can have you know, all your goods back, because I don't want anyone to say that Sodom made me wealthy. I want people to know that God made me wealthy. That's a blessing from God. And you see, he has a choice again. He can choose to be greedy and keep this. I, I deserve this. I rescued. I, me, Abraham, I did it. <laughs> it's mine. And then people say, yeah, you got the blessing of the king of Sodom. The world has blessed you. Or he can give back to him and say, God can bless me. And tithing is the same thing. 
They're saying, God, you blessed me, so I'm giving you back 10% of that blessing. You understand? Because prosperity gospel really turned it on its head to say, if you tithe, you'll be blessed. But God says, because you're blessed, you tithe. And it's totally different. <laughs> yeah, totally different. It's not like a slot machine. It's like gratitude. And, and grace is gratitude. It's like, I'm thankful for everything I have. And, and like I say, if you can't, you find a way to graduate yourself too. Don't, don't, don't be living in guilt and just like, oh, it's impossible for me. Live in the victory of not being a victim any longer. Don't give the devil a foothold into your life, into how way you think and what you do. So he challenges our truth and puts us on a foundation of truth. He challenges our emotions and says, let's learn how to deal with our emotions. He challenges our actions and he says, let's do more than the law asks, but much, much more with grace. Be generous people, overflowing, giving away the life of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Peter says that we should be good stewards of the grace of God. When I read that, I thought, that's amazing. I didn't know I could give God's grace away. I thought Jesus gave grace away because of the cross. <laughs> I thought grace came from God. God's riches at Christ's expense. But suddenly I find I'm a steward of God's grace. I, I also can give grace. I can be generous and I can give people grace. Because out of that generosity, there should be a gratitude in their life that helps them also want to be generous. And so it gets multiplied. And so it's a wonderful thing that God wants to do in his body. He wants to create a culture of grace, a community of grace. That's what will win the war against the devil. Culture of grace. It's the kingdom is all about grace. It's the greatest gift that was ever given to the church. A couple of uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien from Lord of the Rings, you know, he wrote Lord of the Rings. He was born in Bloemfontein, incidentally, just so that I just promote South Africa just a little bit more. <laughs> Bloemfontein in South Africa. But didn't live there or, but anyway, like Elon Musk, you know, we claim him as a, oh, well, maybe we don't. Maybe we just leave him to be American. Right? <laughs> Not about nationality, fortunately, <laughs> about Jesus. But when, when Lewis and Tolkien and others were talking, and they were, they were talking about what is this gift that, the, that Christianity, that the church, that the gospel has brought to the world? What's the greatest gift? And people were saying, you know, well, it's people have been free and, and people have been forgiven and people have uh, had prosperity and governments have changed, democracies come, you know, economics have changed. And they asked Lewis, what do you say? And he says, obviously, he said, it's grace. He says, communities didn't know grace before the gospel. <laughs> See, grace and, and walking in a forgiving nature, being humble, was considered a weakness in society before Jesus. If you walked around, they thought the Jews were weak, just a weak, trodden down people because they, they never rose up to have revenge. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they did, but generally they just said, no, 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 we trust God. And they're like, you're just weak. But when you trust God for revenge, as Paul says in Romans 12, and as he's telling us here, that he will deal with the person what needs to happen. You don't have to be the one to give revenge because you get rid of bitterness, so you don't have to have revenge, and you start to live in grace. So you can be healed, and you can overflow with generosity and bring healing into their life and blessing to them. So he challenges our actions, our emotions, our actions. And then lastly, he challenges our conversations. We should have new conversations. And he says in verse 29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit or bring grace, each word a graceful gift. Yeah, I think, you see, I think is what um, the Passion Translation and Eugene Peterson say, each word a graceful gift or gift of grace. That word benefit is charis. So the NIV has decided to translate it as benefit, which it does, but actually it's bringing grace, much more in line with what Paul is saying. He's bringing grace. Because we can see benefit as many things, but it's bringing grace to those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So all of this can only happen if we let the Holy Spirit work in us because of what Christ has done for us and because of the Father sending the Son, as, he, as he, Paul is saying. So he's saying, okay, let our conversations build, it, build others up, not pull them down. So he's coming to building this community of grace, building a culture of grace. And he's saying that we should do it according to their needs, not our needs. So, so much of what we do is according to our needs, even ministry. And Larry Crabb, that um, counselor, um, Christian counselor, leader, psychologist, 
he would say that we can either choose to have ministry or manipulation. We can manipulate people and get what we need, and it can look like ministry. <laughs> we can even prophesy over them to get what we need, and it looks like ministry. Or we can minister to them. We can give something away, be generous, be gracious, be humble, be forgiving. We're giving something away, trusting God to come, and God meets the needs that we have that we've given away, but they benefit. We build them up. See, that's the gospel. We're trusting God to help us as we overflow with giving something away, whether it's forgiveness or money or conversation. And so it's very easy to gossip and to speak negatively about people, and that divides the body. But when we build up with encouraging, graceful words, we bring the body together. We unite the body. And that's what he's trying to say to do. So um, I met a young guy in Singapore, and he said he went on this, this date with a girl, and uh, he asked his friends, what should I do? What should I do? I'm first date, and I'm not quite sure what to do. And they said, okay, you go out, and you have a meal together, and they went to, they're going to a, a chicken place like Nando's, and they, he says, they said to him, now you, you do this, what it says here, you give according to their needs. So, so you give her the best part of the chicken. Don't take for yourself, you give it to her. According, you know, you give her the best. So he, so he went and he, he, and, he, and he gave her the drumstick. Best part, the one he wanted, he gave to her. And afterwards, she was a bit miffed off with him. And she said she wanted the wing. And he's like, I never asked her. <laughs> I just thought that's what you wanted, because that's what I wanted. And he said, I should have asked her, which would you like? <laughs> said he just dished up, and she's like, gee, so rude. Taking the best for yourself, give me the one I don't want. And he's like, he's sacrificing, and neither of them are happy. <laughs> and so we mustn't give people what we think they would want. We must ask them what they want. It's good to ask, or ask their best friend, or ask their son or daughter, or mother or father. What would they like? What do they like? You know, find out if you're going to give a gift. Because it's so, it's so horrible to give a gift that people don't want. <laughs> Isn't that right? It's like, oh, oh man, and it's costly gen generally. And you, it's what you wanted, you know. I mean, I, I don't want a power tool for Christmas, thanks. <laughs> My family want to give me power tools and you know, I don't want. Well, if I bring my toolbox out on a Saturday morning, my, my girls and my wife start singing. I want to make them happy. I get a kiss. I bring them a toolbox out. I get a kiss. It's like, oh, I love you. I'm like, oh, I just got a toolbox. You know? <laughs> it's so romantic for my wife. I'll bring a toolbox. I'm like, a toolbox? She's like, oh, everything can get fixed. The door handles, the broken tabs, the, those pictures. Are, oh, she's so happy. And I'm like, this is hard work for me. This is not nice. But I get a kiss if I bring a toolbox. <laughs> It's amazing. It's not what I need. It's what they need. It's sacrificial for me. It's like painful for me to bring my toolbox. I hate doing repairs. I don't like it one, but I'd rather call the DIY man. But then he'll get a kiss and he'll be like favored. No, no. I don't want them gathering around him like, oh, you're so handsome. Oh, what muscles you've got. I'm like, no. I just have to bring my toolbox and, you know, struggle along and do my thing. Like, oh, this is going to work. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but we do that, don't we? We, we? we give people what we need and what's going to be good for us. And we don't listen to find out what they need and see what's going to work for them. <laughs> yeah, so I went with Dudley once to um, Dudley Daniel, who started New Covenant Ministries International, the apostolic team that we work with, and he was uh, he was speaking to a group of about twenty pastors who, in the early days of NCMR, were looking in to see how were we doing things, this Book of Acts ministry team, and should they link up with what we're doing and. We sat down, and we sat in a great big circle, and Dudley just said from Book of Acts and Paul's life and how we're going to reach the nations and build bases and the things that NCMI do, plant churches, train leaders, disciple people. And then he finished after about half an hour, and then he said, any, any questions? And they sort of got in a bit of a huddle together, and they said, yeah, we love what you said, 
uh, uh, is, is that the, the leader of that team said, he said, we want to know what's in it for us. What's in it for us? Which I suppose is a good question to ask if you're going to join a team. You know, they've got their team and 20 people and they're bringing a group. And Dudley said, nothing. And I thought, they're just going to walk out the door then. <laughs> this has been a waste of half an hour. <laughs> what's in it for us? Nothing. I'm like, gee. And he said, nothing except together we can reach the nations. I thought, that's the right answer. You see, what's in it for me is, is, is possibly a good question, but it's the wrong question. What's in it for Jesus? What can we do together? How do we sacrifice together to reach the nations? Which then they understood once Daddy told him. And uh, that's what we've got to ask. That way. What, what can I do for Jesus? So, so to minister to each other according to their needs is to say, all right, what, what does Jesus want out of this? What would Jesus do and what should I do for him? And so we become a different kind of people thinking about, okay, let's make our conversations different, not ministry or manipulation. Uh, doing things to encourage others, doing things like Ernie else, that's grace. You're giving away grace to encourage others to reach new heights for the good of the game, for the good of the gospel. Let's go for something different. Bob Dylan wrote a wonderful song, my favorite song, Love Minus Zero Over Lo No Limits. You, if you're over 70, you may remember it. Or 60. <laughs> Britain about the 60s and people putting graffiti on the walls and thinking, because that's what people are doing, thinking of new ways of living and new things to do. And peace and love, like Woodstock, you know. So he sing, his song goes like this. In the dime stores and bus stations, people talk about situations. Reading books, repeat quotations, draw conclusions on the wall with their graffiti. Some speak of the future. My love, she speaks softly. She knows that there's no success like failure, and failure's no success at all. Beautiful, isn't it? So people have got great philosophical ideas, reading books, quotations, conclusions on the wall, which is what they were doing, still do it today, putting their philosophy out. Speaking of the future, what does the future look like? What does the world look like? What will bring peace on earth, peace and love? How will it all work? But then he brings it right down to my love, the one who encourages me. She doesn't speak of the future. She speaks softly. She's close. She's warm. She's encouraging. And she says, there's no success like failure. Try. Do it. Go for it. No success like failure. If you try and you fail, you've not failed because you can try again. You can modify. You can change. You can kill that old beast. Or you can put on Christ and you can start to do what you're called to do. No success like failure. But then... Failure is no success at all. Don't live in your failure, friends. Don't live in your victimhood. Don't live in your past. Paul is saying, take it off. No success like failure. But that thing can help you to move on. But unless you try, you're not going to move on. If you're too afraid, too traumatized, too terrorized, too victimized, you're not going to move on. But if you find grace, you can deal with your emotions. You can deal with your actions. And you can deal with your conversations. And in all of them, grace can begin to flow. Forgiveness can flow. Generosity can flow. And humility can flow. And forgiveness and generosity and humility are the hallmarks of grace. That's what it means, Christ riches at God's, uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. Because of the cross, we can be forgiving because we've been forgiven. We can be generous because we've been given His Son and all these gifts and we can walk humbly with our God because, you know, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Not because of us, but because we have entrusted ourselves to Him who judges justly, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, when Christ went to the cross. He entrusted Himself to Him who judges justly. And when we put off and get our minds renewed and start to put on Christ, we are entrusting ourselves to the power of God to start to work into our lives. That's the Christian life. It's not about modifying your behavior or trying to be good or trying to change a habit. It's about changing the attitude of your mind, saying, I need Christ in me. I need the Holy Spirit to empower me, and I need to live the life my Father has called me to live. There's a sense of destiny and purpose, and Paul brings that out so beautifully in this chapter. Won't you stand with me and just ask him to help us? Beautiful. So thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Lord, you're incredible. Uh, your word is so practical, so boldly truthful, so profoundly wonderful. And your Holy Spirit is so tender and gentle. He is the love we have who comes alongside us and speaks softly and tells us you cannot fail because we have Jesus. But if you should stumble and fall, keep going. If you can't get it right the first time, carry on because it's a journey to become more like him from victimhood to more than conquerors. And so, Lord, I want to pray that you do that in our lives by your grace today, Lord, today. Today, Lord Jesus, thank you, our Lord.